President of court, please quiet in the courtroom. Do you speak Hebrew, sir? Yes. Please place the skull cap on your head and put your right hand on the Bible. And please say after me, I swear by God Almighty that my testimony in this trial will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. What is your full name? Dinur Yechiel. Dinur. D I hyphen N O O R. Mr. Dinur, you live in Tel Aviv in Megiddo Street, yes, number eight. Sir. You are a merchant. You are a writer, I'm sorry. Yes. You were born in Poland? Yes. And you are the author of the books Salamandra and the House of Dolls? And two other books? And the, uh, the book named, they called him Pippel. What is the reason why you chose the literary pseudonym Ka Tsetnik, Mr. Dinur? This is not a pen name. I do not regard myself as a writer writing literature. This is actually the history of the Auschwitz planet, the chronics of Auschwitz. I myself was at Auschwitz camp for two years. <coughs> the time there is not a concept as it is here in our planet. Every fraction of a second has a different wheels of time. And the inhabitants of that planet had no names. They had no parents, and they had no children. They were not clothed as we are clothed here. They were not born there, and they did not conceive there. They breathed and lived according to different laws of nature. They did not live according to the laws of this world of ours, and they did not die. Their name was a number, Katsetnik number so-and-so. They were dressed in, how shall I call it? Mr. Hausner showing the witness a suit of striped clothes. Is that what you used to wear there at Auschwitz? Yes, this is the garb of those who lived on this planet called Auschwitz. And I believe wholeheartedly that 
I must carry this name as long as the world will not awaken after the crucifying of the nation to erase this evil as humanity has risen after the crucifixion of one man. I believe wholeheartedly that the same as in astrology, the stars influence our fate. In the same way, the star at Auschwitz is there facing our planet and influencing, radiating towards our planet. If I am able to stand here in this court before you and retail, retell the tale of this planet, if I, out of this planet of Auschwitz, am able to be here with you today, then I believe with all my being that this is thanks to the oath I made to them there they gave me this strength this power this oath was my armor and uh, this was the power, the unnatural power above nature, which sustained me so that after the period of Auschwitz, two years in Auschwitz, when I was a Muslim, to withstand Auschwitz, they always left me. They always took leave of me. And the look in their eyes had the promise of my oath in them. Almost two years, I stayed there, and I was always left behind. I can still see them gazing at me. I saw them in the queue. And Rosa, could I perhaps, Mr. Dinur, put a few questions to you, if you will consent? President of court, Mr. Dinur, please, please listen to Mr. Hausner and to me. Shh. Check it, check it, check it. Uh, we can listen. Uh, okay. uh, I mean, it's but it is difficult to see from here exactly what did happen. President of court, I'll have to stop the session unless uh, the witness recovers. Mr. Hausner, I did not expect this, of course, to happen, and I think it would be difficult for the witness to recover. Uh, the witness's wife, who is in the audience, is now uh, approaching him.
President of court, I do not believe we can go on. We shall make a, take a recess now, and uh, you, Mr. Attorney General, will kindly inform us as soon as you find out whether the witness is capable of going on. A women's uh, camp um, to which other people had no access. We were working there with those uh, Rollen Wagen which we were drawing. Um, you entered the crematorium? Uh, yes, I entered the crematorium. You saw the inside of the crematorium? We had to go there in order to take uh, the wood uh, which was uh, to be used for the burning. We had to uh, uh, take uh, some of the wood to the camp from the crematorium and when there was still time, and when it was very cold, the capo of the Zander commander took pity on us and said, children, it's very cold outside, uh, perhaps uh, you can uh, get warm in the gas chambers. The gas chambers uh, were, well, of course, not operating the gas chambers to warm yourself. Sometimes you would go to the Kleidungsraum or even to the gas chambers where it was much warmer. Uh, sometimes it would happen that when we arrived at the crematorium, they said you can't possibly get in because there are people inside. Uh, this was the crematorium in August 1943. In, um, uh, to use the ashes of human being and yes. to spread it on the roads? Yes. What for? So that people could walk on the so that they uh, road not and not slip. to slide. In the camp? Yes, in the camp. We took from the crematorium number three the ashes. And we would sprinkle Who it on the path. Who gave the instructions to do so? Question by President of Court. We would go together with one of the block elders there, and there we would get the um, uh, we would get uh, the ashes and we would spread them. A Jew, the block elders who was not always a Jew, uh, most of uh, the block elders who were with us were not Jews. And who gave the instructions to the block elders? Apparently, they would get those instructions from their superiors. Try to rise. 
I would go dizzy and see nothing for a couple of minutes. We were that weak. But did you then uh, see particularly harrowing scene? Yes. We were taken at the end of March in April to a camp called Zeltenlager. Conditions there were below any imagination. People would prefer to sleep under the open sky rather than in the huts. There was an air raid. Nearby, there was an SS camp. And one of the bombs, it seems, made a direct hit. Then another bomb hit our Zeltenlager camp, and I saw on the following morning people eating human flesh. You saw cannibals, actually. Yes, I did. Uh, the inmates of the camp yes. at the flesh of other inmates. Yes. At uh, the dead inmates? Yes. Let me say the victims of the air raid. Yes, that is what I meant to say. Well, der Mechaniker und wenn man dich fragt, wie alt du bist, macht sie auf jeden Fall fünf Jahre jünger und, und wenn man dich fragt, ob du gesund bist, sagst du ja, du darfst hier im KZ nie krank sein. Und da habe ich gefragt, wo sind wir eigentlich? Und da sagt er in Auschwitz, Birkenau. Ken, äh yes, we had to get off the train in a hurry. And uh, they were beating us and shouting at us. We had to line up in fours. I was the one to the left. A veteran prisoner came up to me and asked if I had any money or a watch. Because since I come from Terezin, I may have some valuables on me. Without thinking, without giving it a thought, I handed over my watch. And then, in gratitude, maybe, he told me that here you have, you come to SS men. If he asks you what your profession is, say you're a locksmith, an electrician, or a mechanic. If he asks your age, make it five years less. If he asks you if you are healthy, say you are. One should never be ill in this concentration camp. When I asked him, where are we? He said, you arrived at Birkenau, Auschwitz. And then you underwent this famous selection of Auschwitz, right? Yeah, then the selection, die war eigentlich dann etwas später, nicht, da gehen wir in Gänsemarsch, da stand ein SS-Offizier, stand auf einem, auf einem Tisch und wir mussten so im Gänsemarsch vorgehen und er hat jeden Einzelnen von uns gefragt, Beruf, Alter, vor mir war ein, ein äh, Mann, ein, ein guter Bekannter von mir, mit dem ich mich in Theresienstadt schon angefreundet hatte, er war ungefähr 1,80 Meter großen Anwalt, Skimeister von der Tschechoslowakei, Champion de Ski, ich glaube, das heißt Skimeister, ja, auf Deutsch, ein Skimeister von der Tschechoslowakei. Und er hat den gefragt, Beruf, und da sagt der Rechtsanwalt, und da hat er gleich nach rechts gezeigt. Und da kam die Reihe an mir, und da sagt er zu mir, Beruf, und da habe ich gesagt, Feinmechaniker, Alter, habe ich gesagt, 38, ich war damals schon 43. Und äh, äh, Gesundheit ausgezeichnet. Und da hat er mich sehr prüfend von oben bis unten angeschaut. Ich war etwas mit Blut verschmiert von meinem Gegenüber, der da angeschossen worden ist im Zug. Und ich sah auch sonst wahrscheinlich nicht sehr vertrauenerweckend aus. Wir haben ja nichts gegessen, nichts getrunken gehabt die ganze Zeit während der ganzen Bahnreise. Und da fragte er, wie lange im Fach? Und da habe ich gesagt, 24 Jahre, das ist ja geistesgegenwärtig. Und da hat er nach links gezeigt und so bin ich auch nach links gegangen. Und äh, nachher, wie wir abgezählt worden sind, waren wir, ich glaube, an die 200, 210, 212 darum. 
von dem Transport von 1200 und der zweite Transport, der ist restlos vergast worden. Also der Transport, der direkt nach uns fortging, der ist ganz vergast worden. This was a little a short time later, the selection. We advanced all in line. There was a table with an SS man nearby, and he asked each one of us profession and age. Before me, there was a good friend of mine whom I uh, befriended at Terezin. He was one meter and 80 high, and he was a ski champion in his in home country in Czechoslovakia. He was asked profession, he answered lawyer. He was turned immediately to the right. When my turn came, they asked my profession. I said, a fine mechanic. Age, I said 38, although I was 43 at the time. Your health, I answered perfect. And then he examined me. He, Because my clothes were dirty, smeared with blood, of the dead man next to whom I sat. I did not look in excellent condition because we were hungry and thirsty. He asked how long was the journey? How long did you work in your profession? I said 24 years and then he sent me to the left. When we were counted, those who turned to the left those spared, we were some 200, 210, or maybe 212 out of a transport of over 200 people. The others were taken to be guessed. The train which arrived after us in the same transport was turned to, the, to be killed by gas directly. Now what happened to you? Weber, die am Fensterplatz gegenüber saßen von mir, sagte er, wer hat Fenster aufgemacht? Noch einmal. Und dann ohne eine Antwort abzuwarten, nimmt er seine Pistole und hat den, der am Fenster saß, der das Fenster aufgemacht hat, dem hat er eine Kugel durch den Kopf geschossen und dem, der, dem daneben saß, der gar nichts damit zu tun hatte, eine Kugel durch den Hals. Es war... Entschuldigen Sie. Ja. When in Terezin we boarded the train which was to take us to Birkenau, we did not know at the time where to. I believed that I was very brave and did something, did myself a good turn because I hurried and sat near a window. I sort of conquered a place for myself near the window and was very pri proud of my achievement. Uh, just across there were two che men from Czechoslovakia and a German and one, there were two people nearby, three to a bench before we left. We were told that uh, it was strictly forbidden to open a window or throw anything out of the window. After some 20 or 25 minutes after the journey started, the uh, Czech across the wagon opened his uh, parcel, the food he took for the trip, and wanted to <coughs> eat. An SS man jumped into the wagon. There was one to each wagon to guard. Correction to the interpreter by the Attorney General. The SS man was in the coach. There was an SS man to each coach. SS men stood behind my back. I was sitting and my back was towards the direction of the train. He was behind me. The SS men, there was one to each wagon and asked, who is the man who opened the window? There was silence. No one replied. And then he asked once again, <coughs> asked my neighbor, who opened the window? When there was no answer, he drew his pistol and shot at the Czech who was sitting opposite me 
into his head and then he shot the man who was sitting near him through the neck. Judge Halevi, those who traveled with you, the Czechoslovaks and the Germans, uh, were they not Jews? They they were Jews from Terezin. All those on the train were Jews. Only Jews. President of court, you wanted to explain something? Präsident Und der andere, der nebendran saß, der noch 15 Stunden, vielleicht 12 Stunden, 15 Stunden bis spät in der Nacht gewimmert hat und hat aus dem Hals geblutet. Es war ein Arzt bei uns im Waggon, aber wir durften, der SS-Mann hat verboten, dass man ihm Hilfe bringen durfte. Wir durften gar nichts machen, bis er tot war. Und dann haben wir ihn ebenfalls festgebunden, damit er nicht vornüberfällt. I want to add to correct. I was facing the direction of the train, and the SS man was behind my back. The two men who were shot, the one died immediately, and the other was still alive for 12 or 15 hours. We were not allowed to help him. The dead man and his eyes were in a stare of fright, surprise. We had to tie him to the seat so that the body does not fall forward. The other man, he was whimpering and bleeding. We had water and first aid in the wagon, but we were not allowed to help him. He bled to death. Then we had to tie this man as well to the seat so that he does not fall forward. President of court, Mr. Hausner, what is your next question? Attorney General, and thus you reached Auschwitz-Birkenau with these two dead men. Yeah. Wird zum Tod wegen Sabotage zum Tod durch Erhängen verurteilt. Das Urteil wird sofort vollstreckt. We slept on the concrete floor, on the bare concrete floor. It was very cold. It was in November. During the day, we were occupied in this uh, business or to dismantle the machines and the parts which were still fit for use to be taken by freight cars to Gleiwitz. During the day, we were peeling potatoes. For the following day, we were extremely hungry, and each one of us tried, as we called it at the time, to organize something for himself. That is to get hold of a number of potatoes. When we were coming out, we were being searched. The man next to me, a man from Czechoslovakia, had six to seven potatoes hidden in his pockets. I was not as clever. I had only one potato in my pocket. They took down our numbers, the numbers which were tattooed into our arms. And on the following day in the evening, at the roll call, the commander of that roll call called out our numbers, B-12903 forward, sentenced to death by hanging for sabotage. The sentence will be carried out immediately. President of court, why don't you have a drink of water, Mr. Oppenheimer? 
Der Tscheche wurde dann aufgehängt. Tscheche meinen Sie tschechischer Jude? Der tschechische Jude, ja, es handelt sich immer nur um Juden. Der tschechische Jude wurde aufgehängt. Und zwar nicht auf eine Art, wie man sonst aufgehängt wird, dass man, dass man auf, einem, auf eine Kiste gestellt wird und das wird dann weggestoßen, sondern er wurde aufgezogen. Es war ein sehr qualvoller Tod. Und dann kam die Reihe an mich und wie ich schon einen Strick um den Hals hatte, sagte der Lagerführer oder der in Dreams Lagerführer sagte, das ist ja der, der nur die eine Kartoffel hatte. Und da sagte der André Sessmann, ja, sagt auch, da hängt den zwei Stunden mit den Händen auf. Ich glaube, in dem Moment wäre es mir sehr viel lieber gewesen, wenn ich richtig aufgehängt worden wäre. Die Hände wurden mir auf dem Rücken zusammengebunden und ich wurde so aufgezogen. Die Natur, die ist Gott sei Dank sehr viel barmherziger wie die Menschen. Ich habe sofort nach diesem ungeheuren Schmerz sofort die Besinnung verloren. Und ich weiß nicht, wie lange es ging. Eine Minute, zwei Minuten, fünf Minuten, acht Tage, ich habe keine Ahnung. Ich glaube nicht, dass ich sehr lange dort hing. Ich bin wieder wach geworden, wie ich schon in, auf dem Fußboden der Maschinenhalle wieder lag. Und ein Arzt, der bei uns im Transport war, der hat versucht, mit aller Gewalt meine Arme, die waren ja ausgekugelt, um die wieder einzukugeln. Und ich habe dann die ganze Nacht durch Kompressen bekommen, kalte Kompressen bekommen. Am nächsten Tag musste ich selbstverständlich genauso wie vorher weiterarbeiten. Was? Weiter? Weiterarbeiten. Ich musste genauso wieder in der Transportkolonne arbeiten. Die Freunde, die, die haben natürlich ihr Möglichstes getan, um mir möglichst leichte Arbeit zu geben. Das war schon sehr schwer. Aber Sie haben äh, den nächsten Tag weitergearbeitet? Ja, ja, ich musste weiterarbeiten, ja. Sonst wäre ich ja richtig aufgehängt worden. The Czechoslovakian took the question of the President of Court. This was a Czech Jew. I speak of Jews all the time. This Czech Jew was hanged, but not the usual way of gallows or hanging by uh, mounting a box, or it, which was uh, drawn away later. But the rope was put around his throat, and he was dragged up. Then my turn came. When the tie was already on my neck, the rope, the commander of the camp said, this is the man who stole only one potato. Then the SS man replied, yes, I will have him hanging by his hands for two hours. At that moment, I would have preferred if they actually hanged me. They tied my arms across my back, and thus I was drawn up. But it seems that nature is kinder than human beings. I do not know how, but I went unconscious for two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, or eight days, I cannot tell. But when I came to, I was once again on the concrete floor of this big hall with a doctor trying to revive me and to put back my strained elbows. He was applying cold bandages to my arms. On the following day, I had to go out and work once again. I was in the transportation group, and my comrades did their utmost to make work easier for me. To, uh, in answer to the question by the President of Court, you had to work on the following day? Yes, of course, is the answer. Otherwise, I would have been hanged. Mr. Oppenheimer. Warten. Und die, die nicht rausgelaufen sind, die sind natürlich Leben verbrannt. Wir haben uns, mein Freund und ich, wir haben Angst gehabt, es kommt doch die SS, steckt auch die Latrine in Brand oder kommt rein. Und die sehen uns, und da sind wir über das Brett, sind wir in den. sind wir da runtergesprungen. Und ich glaube, das war das Schlimmste von der ganzen KZ-Zeit. 
da sinkt man so ganz langsam ab und man weiß nicht, wo, wie tief geht es, wo bleibt man stehen. Und wie dann, ich stand ungefähr so tief in dem Kurzstand, habe ich festen Boden unter den Füßen gespürt. Und der Geruch von diesem, von der verbrannten Wolle, von dem Knistern vom Holz, von den angeschossenen und nicht toten, die aus den Baracken gelaufen sind. Ich glaube, das war das Schlimmste, was ich jemals im KZ erlebt habe. Das war schlimmer, wie, wie ich zum Tod verurteilt worden bin. When they left on the march, I could not go with them. I had an inflammation of the glands in my thighs, and I told my friends I could not carry on. Let them go out without me. I cannot raise my feet anymore. I do not care if I die here at Blechheimer. I'd rather die here in Blechheimer than on the road. Then my two acquaintances decided to stay behind and not to join the march, to stay with me. We entered another hut, not the hut we were in before, decided to sleep. All SS men were on their way with the others on the march. The huts were empty. Only later we learned that there were a number of prisoners who stayed behind, uh, some 10 or 15 men. And we went to sleep. All of a sudden, I cannot imagine what happened this afternoon. We were asleep. We did not know what was happening to us. We awoke all of a sudden. There was a call, hurry, the SS men are back. The excitement and the fear, I felt no pain any longer. I dragged my two friends and crossed to a place across the ground. Uh, this was the public lavatories. We stood there and peeped through the cracks to what was going on in the camp. Uh, they started shooting towards the from the towers, the watchtowers around the camp. The SS men set fire to the huts where the people took shelter and where they were in hiding. They stood facing the doors with machine guns, and if anyone ran out of the burning huts, they were shot immediately by the SS men with those machine guns. Those who did not run were burned alive. My friends and myself decided that they would be coming to the lavatories as well and set fire. Then we jumped through the wood, through the seat, into the pit, and this was the worst experience of my life. When we entered those pits of the excrement sinking, sinking slowly, and one does not know how deep, we were sinking. The excrement reached up to my chest, and all of a sudden, I felt solid ground under my feet. The smell of the burning of wool from the huts, the noise of the flames, and the half-burned people, those who were shot but were not dead, they all were this terrible experience, the worst I went through in those camps, far worse than the moment when a sentence of death was declared against myself. Mr. Oppenheimer, how long did you stay there? How long did you hide in that place? 
אני יודע, אני יכול לומר זאת. I do not know, I cannot say. Man hätte gedacht, es war zehn Jahre, es waren vielleicht zwei Stunden, drei, vier Stunden, fünf Stunden, es war jedenfalls schon späte Dämmerung, aber die Dämmerung kam, kam ja, es war ja Januar, die kam ja ziemlich früh, bis wir draußen vor der Baracke sprechen hörten, dass die SS, alle Lagertore sind auf und da haben wir um Hilfe gerufen. Und da kamen, Was, die SS was? Die SS ist fort, fort. die Lagertore. Es waren Häftlinge, die draußen sich zusammen unterhalten haben. Es gab noch ziemlich viele Häftlinge, die genauso durch irgendein Wunder gerettet worden sind wie ich. Nicht alle Baracken sind in Brand gesteckt worden. Es waren gerade die Baracken, die gegenüber von der Latrine waren, wo wir versteckt waren. Okay. Und äh, nachher äh, haben wir um Hilfe gerufen. Es kamen ein paar Mithäftlinge natürlich jüdische Mithäftlinge rein, die haben uns geholfen rausziehen. Wir haben uns mit Schnee, das Wasser gab es keins, wir haben uns mit Schnee gewaschen, so gut wie es möglich war. Und ja. And then the Russian army came and liberated you. Und dann kam die, ja, und das hat noch eine Zeit, das hat noch einige Tage gedauert, die Deutsche sind nicht... Uh, uh, and I would like to get to the end now. Then the Russian army came and liberated you, Mr. Oppenheimer. And Blechheimer is, a and Blechheimer is really a branch, was a branch of Auschwitz? Yes, it is a part of Auschwitz. And how much did you weigh in kilograms when you were liberated? 39 kilos. 79 pounds. The Russians weighed me at the moment I was released. Just because they are Jews? They said I, we didn't do anything. Why? Do you remember the case of the Dutch doctor? I'm a physician for epidemic diseases. I was a physician for epidemic diseases in the city hospital in Bialystok and in the ghetto later. A Dutch physician came once, yes, of course, and he asked me, he was fresh in the camp. He had come from Westerborg, I believe, and he asked me, Tell me, he said, colleague, when shall I see my wife and children? I asked him, why do you ask me this question? And he said, we were told on the ramp at Birkenau that those who are fit for labor are going to a separate camp and the children and the women are going to another camp. They will get better treatment and after two weeks there will be a reunion so that the families could be reunited for some time. And he asked me, when will this reunion take place and how will it take place? And you told him that there were no meetings, no getting together. I told him the truth, but then I was sorry. And he told me, small wonder that the Germans accuse the Jews of atrocity stories. It is impossible, he said. It is impossible what you are telling me here. Because I showed him the crematoria it was 300 yards out of our camp and I asked him do you see that building what do you think it is and he said this is a bakery it was made of bricks red bricks he committed suicide later two weeks later I happened to meet him again he called me I wanted to evade this meeting I saw him from afar he came up to me and it was very embarrassing to me and he said colleague you were right it is murder and I later learned from his Dutch colleagues that he had committed suicide by hanging himself and this was the most popular method of committing suicide in Birkenau he hanged himself on the electrified barbed wire. People ran to the wire. The technical term used there was people are climbing on the wire. The Jews department and I remember them well. Dr. Balin, 
what was this uh, Muslim medically and psychologically? Muslim, this is a word which was created in Auschwitz. That was... President of court, we already heard the explanation from uh, Mr. Kovner, I believe, or Dr. Peretz, was it a previous witness? I don't know. We had no Muslim men in the ghetto, only in Birkenau. These Muslim men, that was the last stage of undernutrition, undernourishment. The first symptom that's interesting was that people who entered the stage of Muslimanship, that was a psychological apparition. They began speaking about food. Usually this was a taboo. Two things were taboo, crematoria and food. Food, that was a reflex. The conditioned reflex, because whenever people spoke about food, the secretion of uh, digestive acids would increase. And people tried not to speak about food. As soon as a person lost that self-control and began remembering the good food which he used to have at home in the good old times, such a talk was called as Muslim conversation. And that was the first stage, and we knew that within a day or two, he would enter the second stage. There was not such a rigorous division, but he would stop taking an interest in his surroundings and would also sees uh, reacting to orders and his motions would become very slow his face frozen like a mask he would no longer have control over his bowels he would relieve himself where he was he, he was not even turning over when he lay down and thus he entered the Muslimanship it was a skeleton with bloated legs and these people because they wanted to drag them from the blocks to the roll calls so they were placed forcibly next to the wall with their hands above their heads their uh, face to the wall for support and it was a skeleton with gray face f leaning against the wall swaying back and forth they had no sense of balance that was the typical Muslim who would be taken afterwards by the skeleton commando with the real bodies. And we had forgotten on the eve of the Day of Atonement, 1944, that it was a day from the Goebbels calendar. The Goebbels calendar. calendar. The meaning of that is that on every Saturday and every Jewish holiday, including Purim and Hanukkah, they would always empty the infirmary, take all the sick people out, and they would empty the Muslim blocks they were and taken to the gas chambers. take them to the gas chambers. That was the Goebbels calendar. A man in the courtroom is screaming hysterically. A man is screaming very hysterically. And three policemen are escorting him outside. President of Court, we'll see now whether we can continue with the presence of the public now. And I said, President of Court, I said we'll now see whether we can keep this up with the public witness. And this was in the middle of the Kol Nidre prayer. Instead of giving it, giving them the food gradually uh, to grow, make them accustomed to normal food, they began overeating and they got diarrhea. And uh, all in all, only 60 odd people survived from the 25,000 who left together with you.
precisely. I merely wanted to say that I lost consciousness three days. I was in semi-consciousness. I became a Muslim. I began seeing visions. I knew this was the sign, hallucinations. And when I was already in this state of semi-consciousness, the dim consciousness, they did not take me to the construction gang anymore. I had to polish and rub the, sweep the floor and scrub the floor. And I was sitting on the floor one day and I saw boots, SS boots approaching me. Of course, automatically I got up, mütze up, hat off, and I saw Mengele. He recognized me in that state, even though I did not resemble myself. And this was three days before the liberation. He knew that the war was lost to the Germans. And he asked me, what are you doing here? I said, I am scrubbing the floor. And he left. He said, go on. And I was sure, although I had this dim consciousness, semi-dead, I did not feel the tips of my fingers, my nose or my, my cheekbones. My legs were bloated. I knew these phenomena well. I knew he would search me. He would want to remove a witness who was present when the gypsy camp was liquidated. And I do not know whether he was looking for me or not because they took me on that evening to the Starken block, to the dying block, block of the dying men. I was in the municipal hospital in Gablons on the Neisse when I was liberated four days later. I was in the room of the medical personnel, a separate and extra room. With a, that's when I woke up in a clean bed with flowers near my bed. Uh, who liberated?